Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. In December 1995, American Airlines Flight 965 departed from Miami on a regularly scheduled trip to Cali, Colombia. On the landing approach, the pilot of the 757 needed to select the next radio navigation fix named Rozo. He entered an R into his navigation computer. The computer returned a list of nearby navigation fixes starting with R. And the pilot selected the first of these, whose latitude and longitude appeared to be correct. Unfortunately, instead of Rozo, the pilot selected Romeo, 132 miles to the northeast. The jet was southbound, descending into a valley that runs north-south, and any lateral deviation was dangerous. Following indications on the flight computer, the pilots began an easterly turn and slammed into a granite peak at 10,000 feet. 152 passengers and all eight crew members aboard perished. Four passengers survived with serious injuries. The National Transportation Safety Board investigated and declared the problem human error. The navigational aid the pilots were following was valid, but not for the landing procedure at Cali. In the literal definition of the phrase, this was indeed human error because the pilot selected the wrong fix. The computer told the pilot he was tracking precisely to the beacon he had selected. Unfortunately, it neglected to tell him the beacon he selected was a fatal choice. Because of the devil's work in this world, he has put so many false beliefs into this world that millions upon millions make fatal choices and they track to the wrong beacon for their eternal destiny. And this results in their everlasting destruction in the lake of fire. The only beacon that brings us safely home is the Lord Jesus Christ and faith alone in his death, burial, and resurrection, that he died for our sins and rose again. We must make the correct choice to trust Christ alone as our personal Savior. When we think of the chaos, confusion, temptations, deception, opposition against God, broken families, corrupt governments, that all grips this world, much of which is the result of Satan's work, it is very comforting to know that the devil's days are numbered. God is in control, and he will have the final say over the devil. Satan himself has made a fatal choice in rebelling against God. Satan at first will be bound for 1,000 years, and then he will be cast into the lake of fire to suffer in torment there forever and ever. Beginning with this episode, we'll begin a series called Scenes from the Final Act which are the events that the Apostle John saw leading up to and then into the eternal state as recorded in the last three chapters of our Bible. Revelation chapter 20 verse 1 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. In this scene, John saw an angel descend from heaven with a key and a chain in his hand. Although the Apostle John does not identify this particular angel, in all probability it will be Michael the archangel. Because it is Michael and his angels who will have cast Satan and his angels to earth three and a half years earlier during the tribulation period, as Revelation 12 teaches. Because Satan had been cast down to the earth, the angel here in verse 1 must come down from heaven to the earth. This is a reminder to us of Satan's demotion and humiliation, and he's about to experience further humiliation, teaching us that it is not necessary for Jesus Christ and his infinite strength to throw Satan into the bottomless pit. He invests authority in one of his angels to do this work. This is another way that Satan is disgraced. And any and every possible way that the devil is disgraced, 
we should be glad about it. At this time in the events of the tribulation period, all unbelievers will either have been killed at the battle of Armageddon or have been cast into everlasting fire at the judgment of the nations as recorded in Matthew 25. The beast and the false prophet will have already been thrown into the lake of fire after the battle of Armageddon, making them its first two inhabitants. All those in rebellion against the king of Israel must be removed before Christ sets up his worldwide earthly kingdom. The last step before the establishment of Christ's kingdom is the removal of the foremost rebel, the devil and his demonic host. What this teaches is that Christ will reign on earth without any opposition from supernatural enemies. Before the nations can be freed from the control of the devil in the kingdom, the devil first must be bound. John records that the archangel is bearing the key to the bottomless pit in a great chain. This indicates that he, he has delegated authority to bind Satan and cast him into the bottomless pit. Now Christ himself said in Revelation 1.18 that he had the key of Hades. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of hell, or Hades, and of death. The Lord Jesus Christ has the keys for Hades and the bottomless pit, and he can give those keys to whomever he chooses. Like the keys we use daily to enter our houses and workplaces, this key for the bottomless pit is for the purpose of opening and locking. The archangel has the key, and he has granted the power by Christ to open the bottomless pit and to lock and bind Satan inside it for 1,000 years. Now, although the demonic host is not mentioned specifically in Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3, the binding of Satan assures that all those under his command will also be bound. We see from an account in the Gospels that the demons expected and feared this reality of being bound in the bottomless pit. During our Lord's earthly ministry, he traveled to Gadara and met the crazed man who had a legion of demons in him. At this encounter, the demons in the man caused him to cry out to the Lord, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us? before the time. In Luke's account of this miracle, the demons in the man besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep or the abyss. Knowing of his power and authority as God and their creator and that the Lord could send them any place he wanted to, the demons can only beg him to not inca incarcerate them in the deep or in the Hades, in the center of the earth. All the demons cast with Satan into the bottomless pit after Armageddon will not be able to break the great chain that will bind them for 1,000 years. And it is because they will be held there by the almighty power of God. Demons don't want to be locked in that pit in torment. They have long feared being cast into the abyss. After the battle of Armageddon, their fears will be realized. The intention of the great chain is not to represent Satan and his demons as just being restricted, but that they are rendered completely inactive. Satan's influence will not be lessened. It will be non-existent during the millennial reign of Christ. Revelation 20 verse 2 reads, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. This series of names for our enemy, dragon, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan, point to different features of our enemy's evil character, and it teaches us about his tactics. Dragon is a title given to him 12 times in Revelation. It speaks of his cruelty and murderous ways. John 8:44 says that he is a murderer from the beginning. 
The title dragon refers to the ferocity with which he persecutes the people of God. Revelation 12, 17 reads, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. A fierce persecution by the dragon against God's people Israel will take place in the future tribulation. And his persecution takes place around the world today against God's people, the church, the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace. The Center for the Study of Global Christianity, an academic research center that monitors worldwide demographic trends in Christianity, estimates that between the years 2005 and 2015, 900,000 Christians were martyred. This is an average of 90,000 Christians each year. Open Doors also documented a total of 1,329 churches attacked worldwide for faith-related reasons between November 1, 2015 and October 31, 2016. We need to be in prayer for the church as a whole and for those in countries where the practice of their faith is life-threatening. Here we face rejection, ridicule, and mocking for our faith in Christ in the United States. Laws are being formed which are in opposition to God's word and prayer. But the day is coming when we will likely face the exact same grave dangers others around the world face for their faith. Imprisonment, beatings, torture, violence, executions. Remember who's the God of this world? The dragon. And as the dragon and as the God of this world, this is the direction we should expect that he will drive things and not be surprised when it happens. Revelation 20 verse 2 also calls him that old serpent. And this title takes us back the quarter of time to the beginning to the Garden of Eden and Satan's temptation of our first parents, Adam and Eve. That old serpent refers to his guile and the poisonous deception by which he has operated from the beginning until this moment. John 8, adds, There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Revelation 12, 9 says of him, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, which deceiveth the whole world. The old serpent is old and has deceived mankind for thousands of years since the beginning. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Revelation, Volume 1, is a hardcover 208-page commentary written by Pastor Paul M. Sadler and covers Revelation 1-1 through 617. The world has always had an insatiable desire to know the future. We are thankful that God has hidden all future events from mankind, except for those he has chosen to reveal to us concerning things to come, which are spiritually discerned. The purpose of this volume is to dispel the notion that the church, the body of Christ, is the subject of the first four chapters of the book of Revelation. With God's help, this book presents a bird's eye view of what lies ahead. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Devil is another name for the one who will be bound 1,000 years. Devil is the Greek word diablos. It signifies how he is a false accuser or slanderer. In Revelation 12.10 we read, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, 
which accuse them before our God day and night. In the book of Job, we see Satan doing this very thing. The false accuser, the accuser of the brethren, believed Job would curse God to his face if the Lord's hand of blessing was taken away and Job lost his loved ones and er earthly possessions. But Job never did curse God, not during his time of deep grief, not when his friends questioned him and accused him of having done something wrong that brought this calamity on himself, and not even when his wife encouraged him to curse God. The devil, the accuser of the brethren, wants to have something evil that can be said of every believer in Christ in order to accuse and discredit us and destroy our testimony for Christ. And there are countless examples of those in the church who have fallen by the wayside, victims of temptation, false doctrine, and worldliness. Satan means adversary, or to set oneself in opposition to another. Satan is diametrically opposed to all that is good and all that is God's. He is the enemy of God, the enemy of God's Son, and the enemy of all God's people from both programs of God, prophecy and the mystery. Under God's earthly prophetic program in the past, Satan was the adversary of the nation Israel, and he will again be their adversary in the future tribulation period. Under God's heavenly mystery program currently, he is the adversary of the church, the body of Christ, in this dispensation of the grace of God. Satan hates and opposes God's plans and purposes for the earth and believing Israel who will inhabit it forever. And Satan hates and opposes God's plans for the heavens and the members of the body of Christ who will inhabit it forever. The name Satan teaches that he is God's enemy. And that being so, for believers, for us, he's our enemy. And it's good to hate him. We should hate the devil. As Satan opposes God, he attacks God through us. For this reason, we need to heed the instruction to put on the whole armor of God. Now let's stop and put all these names and titles together. The one who's bound for a thousand years is the dragon that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. By the titles and names of the devil, you learn about the things that will not be present on the earth during the millennial reign of Christ because of Satan being bound during this time. There will be no spiritual influence by the dragon to bring about the cruel persecution of God's people. There won't be temptations or poisonous deceptions through errors and lies by that old serpent. The devil, the false accuser, won't be active trying to manipulate and lead people to fall into sin, to be able to accuse them and destroy their testimonies for Christ. Satan won't be around to bring about spiritual opposition to God and his plans and purposes. The prophetic scriptures teach us many things that will be present during Christ's earthly reign. The whole earth will be full of His glory. There will be peace on earth and righteousness, justice, and equity will pervade all things. In Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3, we also learn what the kingdom will be like through the binding of Satan in the conspicuous absence of his wicked influences and activities. His presence and influence will not in any sense be felt during the earthly kingdom reign of Christ. And this will result in global transformation. Christ's presence and the devil's absence will make it heaven on earth. While the kingdom has been revealed since the foundation of the world, the Apostle John is the first one to tell us that the duration of that golden age will be 1,000 years. This is the first mention of it in Revelation chapter 20. A thousand duration, year duration of the reign of Christ on the earth was never foretold by the prophets and is not found anywhere else in God's word. Instead, what you find in prophecy is that the kingdom is to be an everlasting kingdom. 
Daniel 2.44 says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, and it shall stand forever. When Christ establishes an earthly kingdom, it will last forever. But the book of Revelation reveals additional details about the everlasting kingdom that the prophets never talked about and never knew. And one of those details is the millennial aspect, that the first 1,000 years would be separated from the rest of the everlasting kingdom. Revelation 20 and 21 details events between the 1,000 years and the eternal state. In between are the events of the loosing of Satan, the deception of the nations, the battle of Gog and Magog, the great white throne, the passing away of the first heaven in the first earth and the creation of the new heavens in the new earth. Revelation 20 verse 3 reads, And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Unlike the Antichrist and the false prophet, Satan is not cast into the lake of fire after the battle of Armageddon, though that is coming for the devil. Satan is first cast into the bottomless pit in the center of the earth. The location of the bottomless pit is clearly defined for us in the Word of God. The unseen world known as Hades in the scriptures has a region called the bottomless pit, which is the translation of the Greek word abyss. Isaiah also speaks of the binding of Satan in the abyss during the millennium when he states, Yet thou, or Lucifer, shalt be brought down to hell, that is Sheol, or Hades, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? When he is confined to Hades, he will be an object of astonishment. The inhabitants of Hades, even in their torment, will marvel when they see this guy, that this was the one that shook kingdoms? They will be amazed that the one who is seemingly so powerful as to make the earth tremble has been brought so low. Lucifer being cast into the pit will be the most startling event that the underworld has ever known. Satan has worked behind the scenes for millennia, deceiving and corrupting the world with his lies, but his days are numbered. People often talk about the way things in this world should be. One of the main reasons why this world is not as it should be will be removed by Christ prior to his millennial reign. For 1,000 years, Satan will be confined to the infernal region below. And when Christ reigns without the influence of the devil, this world will be as it should be. Satan will be seized and hurled into the center of the earth by the archangel, and he will be bound there by a great chain and sealed in the pit. After the Savior's death on the cross, a seal was placed on the stone at the entrance of Christ's tomb. Matthew 27, 66 says, So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. But on resurrection morning, the seal was broken and the stone was rolled away because Christ had conquered the grave. That seal could never have kept him in that tomb. He is the resurrection and the life. He has power over death. A seal will be set upon the devil when he is shut in the bottomless pit and demonstrating that he is a weak created being. He is powerless to break that seal. William Gurnall writes, when God says, stay, Satan must stand like a dog by the table while the saints feast on God's comfort. He does not dare to snatch even a tidbit, for the master's eye is always upon him. God will tell Satan to stay in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years, and he will stay. If Satan could break this seal, he absolutely would. He will have 1,000 years to try, but he will not. 
This shows that we who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are on the Lord's side, we are on the side of power, victory, and hope. But those who are outside of Christ, they are on the side of weakness, defeat, and hopelessness. By faith in Christ alone, the unbelieving can be rescued and delivered from the power or domain of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Satan being unable to break his seal in the bottomless pit assures us that he cannot and will never break our seal. Ephesians 1.13 reads, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Satan can do nothing about our salvation and eternal security in Christ. We are sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit, and the devil can't do a thing about that seal. The divine seal placed upon Satan by God ensures that he will no longer deceive the nations during the thousand years of Christ's earthly kingdom. Satan will be sealed in his prison, giving blessed relief to the earth and its inhabitants. After the thousand-year phase of Christ's earthly kingdom is fulfilled, he must be loosed a little season. Satan will not be rehabilitated during his thousand-year sentence. God reveals to us that Satan's nature will not change even after 10 centuries of confinement. He will remain proud, defiant, and at enmity against God. His hatred of God will only further be kindled after the thousand years. The loosing of Satan for a short time is part of God's sovereign plan. It says he must be loosed. Everything God does is good and righteous. This even has a perfect purpose. God gives the human race a final chance after Christ's earthly reign to, true, to choose. Mankind has a free will, and at the close of the millennium, just prior to the eternal state, God gives the inhabitants of Christ's earthly kingdom, who will be born during the kingdom, the right to choose to believe in Christ or to reject Him. How about you right now? Have you chosen to receive Christ as your Savior, or have you rejected Him? Have you trusted in Christ as your personal Savior? Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.